Section 1 of The Magic of the Horseshoe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence. Section 1 The Magic of the Horseshoe, Part 1. And still o'er many a neighboring door she saw the horseshoe's curved charm. Whittier, the witch's daughter. Happy art thou, as if every day thou hadst picked up a horseshoe. Longfellow, Evangeline. 1. History of the Horseshoe The evolution of the modern horseshoe from the primitive footgear for draft animals used in ancient times furnishes an interesting subject for investigation. Xenophon and other historians recommend various processes for hardening and strengthening the hooves of horses and mules, and from this negative evidence some writers have inferred that the ancients were ignorant of farrowry. It seems indeed certain that the practice of protecting the feet of horses was not universal among the Greeks and Romans. Fabretti, an Italian antiquary, examined with care the representations of horses on many ancient columns and marbles, and found but one instance in which the horse appeared to be shod. And in most specimens of ancient art, the iron horseshoe is conspicuous by its absence. But in the mosaic portraying the Battle of Issus, which was unearthed at Pompeii in 1831, and which is now in the Naples Museum, is the figure of a horse whose feet appear to be shod with iron shoes similar to those in modern use. And in an ancient Finnish incantation against the plague, Quoted in the Loremont's Chaldean Magic and Sorcery, occur these lines. O scourge, depart. Plague, take thy flight. I will give thee a horse with which to escape, whose shoes shall not slide on ice, nor whose feet slip on the rocks. No allusion to the horseshoe is made by early writers on veterinary topics. But, on the other hand, there is abundant testimony that the ancients did sometimes protect the feet of their beasts of burden. Wickelman, the Prussian art historian, describes an antique engraved stone representing a man holding up a horse's foot, while an assistant, kneeling, fastens on a shoe. In the works of the Roman poet Catullus occurs a simile of the iron shoe of a mule sticking in the mire. Contemporary historians relate that the emperor Nero caused his mules to be shod with silver, while golden shoes adorned the feet of the mules belonging to the notorious empress Pompeia. Mention of an iron horseshoe is made by Appian, a writer not indeed remarkable for accuracy, but the phrase brazen-footed steeds, which occurs in Homer's Iliad, is regarded by commentators as a metaphorical expression for strength and endurance. Wrappings of plated fiber, as hemp or broom, were used by the ancients to protect the feet of horses. But the most common form of foot covering for animals appears to have been a kind of leather and sock or sandal, which was sometimes provided with an iron sole. This covering was fastened round the fetlocks by means of thongs, and could be easily removed. Iron horseshoes of peculiar form, which have been exhumed in Great Britain in recent years, have been objects of much interest to archaeologists. In 1878, a number of such relics, shaped for the hoof and pierced for nails, were found at a place called Caesar's Camp, near Folkestone, England. In the south of Scotland, also, Ancient horseshoes have been found, consisting of a solid piece of iron made to cover the whole hoof, and very heavy. In the year 1653, a piece of iron resembling a horseshoe, and having nine nail holes, was found in the grave of Childeric I, king of the Franks, who died A.D. 481. Professor N. S. Schaller believes that the iron horseshoe was invented in the 4th century, and from the fact that it was first called Selene, the moon, from its somewhat crescent-like shape, he concludes that it originated in Greece. But even in the ninth century, in France, horses were shod with iron on special occasions only, and the early Britons, Saxons, and Danes do not appear to have had much knowledge of ferrery. The modern art of shoeing horses is thought to have been generally introduced in England by the Normans under William the Conqueror. Henry de Fers, who accompanied that monarch, is believed to have received his surname because he was entrusted with the inspection of the farriers, and the coat of arms of his descendants still bears six horseshoes. On the gate of Oakham Castle, an ancient Norman mansion in Rutlandshire, built by Wickeland de Fares, son of the first earl of that name, 
were formerly to be seen a number of horseshoes of different patterns. The estate is famous on account of the tenure of the barons occupying it. Every nobleman who journeyed through its precincts was obliged, as an act of homage, to forfeit his shoe of the horse whereon he rode, or else to redeem it with a sum of money, and the horseshoes thus obtained were nailed upon the gate, but are now within, on the walls of the castle. These walls are covered by memorials of royal personages and peers, who have thus laid tribute to the custom of the county. Queen Elizabeth is thought to have initiated this practice, though this opinion is incorrect. According to tradition, she was once journeying on a visit to her lord high treasurer, William Cecil, the well-known Lord Burley, at his residence near Stamford. While passing through Oakham, her horse is said to have cast a shoe, and in memory of the mishap, the queen ordered a large iron shoe to be made and hung up in the castle, and that every nobleman traveling through the town should follow her example. A similar usage prevails today, new shoes being provided of shapes and sizes chosen by the donors. While John of Gaunt, 1339 to 99, son of Edward III of England, was riding through the town of Lancaster, his horse cast a shoe, which was kept as a souvenir by the townspeople and fastened in the middle of the street. And in accordance with a time-honored custom, a new shoe was placed in the same spot every seven years by the residents of Horseshoe Corner. The practical value of the horseshoe is tersely expressed in the old German saying, a nail preserves a country. For the nail keeps in place the horseshoe, the shoe protects the foot of the horse, the horse carries the knight, the knight holds the castle, and the castle defends the country. The following story, from Grimm's Household Tales, Volume 2, page 303, may be appropriate in this place, as illustrating the same idea, besides pointing a moral. The Nail A merchant had done a good business at the fair. He had sold his wares and lined his money bags with gold and silver. Then he wanted to travel homeward and be in his house before nightfall. So he packed his trunk with the money on his horse and rode away. At noon he rested in a town, and when he wanted to go further, the stable boy brought out his horse and said, A nail is wanting, sir, in the shoe of its left hind foot. Let it be wanting, answered the merchant. The shoe will certainly stay on for the six miles I have still to go. I am in a hurry. In the afternoon, when he once more alighted and had his horse fed, the stable boy went to him and said, Sir, a shoe is missing from your horse's left hind foot. Shall I take him to the blacksmith? Let it still be wanting, answered the man. The horse can very well hold on for a couple of miles which remain. I am in haste. He rode forth. But before long the horse began to limp. It had not limped long before it began to stumble and it had not stumbled long before it fell down and broke its leg. The merchant was forced to leave the horse where it was, and unbuckle the trunk, take it on his back, and go home on foot. And there he did not arrive until quite late at night. And that unlucky nail, he said to himself, has caused all this disaster. Hasten slowly. 2. The Horseshoe as a Safeguard your wife's a witch, man. You should nail a horseshoe on your chamber door. Sir Walter Scott, Red Gauntlet As a practical device for the protection of horses' feet, the utility of the iron horseshoe has long been generally recognized, and for centuries, in countries widely separated, it has also been popularly used as a talisman for the preservation of buildings or premises from the wiles of witches and fiends. To the student of folklore, a superstition like this, which has exerted so wide an influence over men's minds in the past, and which is also universally prevalent in our own times, must have a peculiar interest. What, then, were the reasons for the general adoption of the horseshoe as a talisman? It is our purpose to consider the various theories seriatim. Among the Romans, there prevailed a custom of driving nails into cottage walls as an antidote against the plague. Both this practice and the later one of nailing up horseshoes have been thought by some to originate from the rite of the Passover. The blood sprinkled upon the doorposts and lintel at the time of the great Jewish feast formed the chief points of an arch, and it may be that with this in mind people adopted the horseshoe as an arch-shaped talisman, and it thus became generally emblematic of good luck. The same thought may underlie the practice of the peasants in the west of Scotland, who trained the boughs of the rowan or mountain ash tree in the form of an arch over a farmyard gate to protect their cattle from evil. 3. 
horns, and other two-pronged objects. The supernatural qualities of the horseshoe as a preservative against imaginary demons have been supposed to be due to its bifurcated shape, as any object having two prongs or forks was formerly thought to be effective for this purpose. As with the crescent, the source of this belief is doubtless the appearance of the moon in certain of its phases. Hence, according to some authorities, is derived the alleged efficacy as amulets of horseshoes, the horns and tusks of animals, the talons of birds, and the claws of wild beasts, lobsters, and crabs. Hence, too, the significance of the oft-quoted line from Robert Herrick's Hesperides. Hang up hooks and shears to scare, hence the hag that rides the mare. The horn of the fabulous unicorn, in reality none other than that of the rhinoceros, is much valued as an amulet, and in West Africa, where the horns of the wild animals are greatly esteemed as fiend scarers, a large horn filled with mud and having three small horns attached to its lower end is used as a safeguard to prevent slaves from running away. In the vicinity of Mizapur in central Hindustan, the Howas tie on the necks of their children the roots of jungle plants as protective charms, their efficacy being thought to depend on their resemblance to the horns of certain wild beasts. The Mohammedans of northern India use a complex amulet composed in part of a tiger's claw and two claws of the large horned owl with the tips facing outward, while in southern Europe we find the necks of mules ornamented with two boars tusks or with the horns of an antelope. Amulets fashioned in the shape of horns and crescents are very popular among the Neapolitans. Elworthy quotes at some length from the Mica degli Antichi of Andrea de Giore, Napoli, 1832, in illustration of this fact. From this source, we learn that the horns of Sicilian oxen and of bullocks are in favor with the nobility and aristocracy as evil eye protectives, and are frequently seen on their houses and in their gardens. Stag antlers are the favorite with grocers and chemists, while the lower classes are content with the horns of rams and goats. The Sicilians are wont to tie pieces of red ribbon to the little horns which they wear as charms, and this is supposed vastly to increase their efficiency. In southern Spain, particularly in Andalusia, the stag's horn is a very favorite talisman. The native children wear a silver-tipped horn suspended from the neck by a braided cord made from the hair of a black mare's tail. It is believed that an evil glance directed that the child is received by the horn, which thereby breaks asunder, and the malevolent influence is thus dissipated. Among the Arabs, the horn amulet is believed to render inert the malign glance of an enemy, and in the oasis of the desert, the horned heads of cattle are to be seen over the doors of the Arab dwellings as talismans. In Lesbos, the skulls of oxen or other horned creatures are fixed upon trees or sticks to avert the evil eye from the crops and fruits. In Mongolia, the horns of antelopes are prized on account of their alleged magical properties. Fortune-tellers and diviners affect to derive a knowledge of futurity by observation of the rings which encircle them. The Mongols set a high value upon whip handles made from these horns, and aver that their use by horsemen promotes endurance in their steeds. Inasmuch as the horns of animals serve as weapons both for attack and defense, they were early associated in men's minds with the idea of power. Thus, in ancient times, the corners of altars were fastened in the shape of horns, doubtless in order to symbolize the majesty and power of the being in whose honor sacrifices were offered. Apropos of horns as symbols of strength, the peasants of Banu, a district of the Punjab, believe that God placed the newly created world upon a cow's horn, the cow on a fish's back, and the fish on a stone, but what the stone rests upon they do not venture to surmise. According to their theory, whenever the cow shakes her head, an earthquake naturally results. The Siamese attribute therapeutic qualities to the horns and tusks of certain animals, and the pharmacopoeia contains a somewhat complex prescription used as a feverfuge, whose principal ingredients are the powdered horns of a rhinoceros, bison, and stag, the tusks of an elephant and the tiger, and the teeth of a bear and crocodile. These are mixed together with water, and half of the resulting compound is to be swallowed, the remainder to be rubbed upon the body. The monoconortu, or anti-witch gesture, is used very generally in southern and central Italy. Its antiquity is vouched for by its representation in ancient paintings unearthed at Pompeii. It consists in flexing the two middle fingers, while the others are extended in imitation of horns. 
when the hand in this position is pointed at an obnoxious individual, the malignity of his glance is believed to be rendered inert. In F. Marion Crawford's novel, Pietro Gisleri, one of the characters, Laura Arden, was regarded in Roman society as a jetrice, that is, one having the evil eye. Such a reputation once fastened on a person involves social ostracism. In the presence of the unfortunate individual, every hand was hidden to make the talismanic gesture, and at the mere mention of her name, all Rome made horns. No one ever accosted her without having the fingers flexed in the approved fashion, unless, indeed, they had about them some potent amulet. It is a curious fact that the possession of evil eye may be imputed to any one, regardless of character or position. Pope Pius IX was believed to have this malevolent power, and many devout Christians, while on their knees awaiting his benediction, were accustomed slyly to extend a hand towards him in the above-mentioned position. In an article on Asiatic symbolism in the Indian Antiquary, volume 15, 1886, Mr. H. G. M. Murray Angsley says, in regards to Neapolitan evil eye amulets, that they were probably introduced in southern Italy by Greek colonists of Asiatic ancestry, who settled at Cume and other places in that neighborhood. Whether fashioned in the shape of horns or crescents, they are survivals of an ancient childhood symbol. It has been said that nothing, unless perhaps a superstitious belief, is more easily transmittable than a symbol, and the people of antiquity were wont to attribute to every symbol a talismanic value. The modern Greeks, as well as the Italians, wear little charms representing the hand as making this gesture. But not alone in the south of Europe exists the belief in the peculiar virtues of two-pronged objects, for in Norway reindeer horns are placed over the doors of farm buildings to drive off demons, and the fine antlers which grace the homes of successful hunters in our own country are doubtless often regarded by their owners as of more value than mere trophies of the chase, insomuch as traditional fancy invests them with such extraordinary virtues. In France, a piece of stag horn is thought to be a preservative against witchcraft and disease, while in Portugal, ox horns fastened on poles are placed in melon patches to protect the fruit from withering glances. Among the Ossetes, a tribe of the Caucasus, the women arrange their hair in the shape of a chamois horn, curving forwards over the brow, thus forming a talismanic coiffure. And when a Muslim takes his child on a journey, he paints a crescent between its eyes, or tattoos the same device on its body. The modern Greek, too, adopts the precaution of attaching a crab's claw to the child's head. In northern Africa, the horns of animals are very generally used as amulets, the prevailing idea being everywhere the same, namely, that pronged objects repel demons and evil glances. Horns are used in eastern countries as ornaments to headdresses, and serve, moreover, as symbols of rank. They are often made of precious metals, sometimes of wood. The tantora worn by the Drusus of Mount Lebanon in Syria has this shape. In the Bulgarian villages of Macedonian Thrace, the so-called wise woman, who combines the professions of witch and midwife, is an important character. Immediately upon the birth of a child, this personage places a reaping hook in a corner of the room to keep away unfriendly spirits, the efficacy of the talisman being doubtless due partly to its shape, which bears considerable resemblance to a horseshoe. And in Albania, a sickle, with which straw has just been cut, is placed for a few seconds on the stomach of a newly born child to prevent the demons who cause colic from exercising their functions. The mystic virtue of the fork shape is not, however, restricted to its faculty of averting the glance of an evil eye or other malign influences, for the divining rod is believed to derive from the same peculiarity of form its magical power of detecting the presence of water or metals when wielded by an experienced hand. 4. The Symbol of the Open Hand it is worthy of note that the symbol of an open hand with extended fingers was a favorite talisman in former ages, and was to be seen, for example, at the entrances of dwellings in ancient Carthage. It is also found on Libyan and Phoenician tombs, as well as on Celtic monuments in French Brittany. Dr. H. C. Trumbull quotes evidence from various writers showing that this symbol is in common use at the present time in several eastern lands. In the region of ancient Babylonia, the figure of a red outstretched hand is still displayed on houses and animals. In Jerusalem, the same token is frequently placed above the door, or on the lintel on account of its reputed virtues in averting evil glances. The Spanish Jews of Jerusalem draw the figure of a hand in red upon the doors of their houses, and they also place upon their children's heads 
silver hand-shaped charms, which they believed to be specially obnoxious to unfriendly individuals desirous of bringing evil either upon the children themselves or upon other members of the household. In different parts of Palestine, the open-hand symbol appears alike on the houses of Christians, Jews, and Muslims, usually painted in blue on or above the door. Claude Rainier Condeur, R.E., in Heth and Moab, remarks on the antiquity of this pagan emblem, which appears on Roman standards and on the scepter of Siva in India. He is of the opinion that the figure of the red hand, whether sculptured on Irish crosses, displayed on Indian temples, or on Mexican buildings, is always an example of the same original idea, that of a protective symbol. A white hand print is commonly seen upon the doors and shutters of Jewish and Muslim homes in Beirut, or other Syrian towns, and even the Christian residents of these towns sometimes mark windows and flower boxes with this emblem, after dipping the hand in whitewash in order to avert chilling February winds from old people and to bring luck to the bin. In Germany, a rude ambulant having the form of an open hand is fashioned out of the stems of coarse plants, and is deemed an ample safeguard against diverse misfortunes and sorceries. It is called the Hand of St. Joan, or the Hand of Fortune. The Jewish matrons of Algeria fasten little golden hands to their children's caps, or to their glass bead necklaces, and they themselves carry about similar luck tokens. In northwestern Scotland, whoever enters a house where butter is being made is expected to lay his hand upon the churn, thereby signifying that he has no evil designs against the butter maker, and dissipating any possible effects of an evil eye. As a charm against malevolent influences, the Arabs of Algeria make use of rude drawings representing an open hand, placed either above the entrances of their habitations or within doors, a symbolic translation of the well-known Arabic imprecation, Five Fingers in Thine Eye. Sometimes the same meaning is conveyed by five lines, one shorter than the others to indicate the thumb. End of Section 1 Recording by Todd